Welcome to the University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology's YouTube channel. This is a anesthesiology keyword review based around the keywords fluids and anesthesia. These keywords are published by the American Board of Anesthesia, including those shown here from over the last decade. In 2018, our represented the keywords in green. In 2019, those in purple. And we'll go right into our review now, starting with fluid physiology and the glycocalyx. The glycocalyx is on the luminal side of healthy vessels, and when it's intact, crystalloids will pass through, but colloids are held back. We want to protect that glycocalyx by limiting trauma to it, uh, surgical trauma that is, and avoiding intravascular hypervolemia, which can damage it. Starling's law of capillaries helps determine where fluids will go, and it's a balance between hydrostatic pressure, which is pushing fluid out through the vascular endothelium, and oncotic pressure, which is a force drawing it back in to the blood vessel. Filtration coefficient refers to basically how leaky the vessel wall is and is also a factor in the balance of fluids. For example, a septic patient may have a leaky vascular endothelium. Body water and osmolality is the next key word. Body water normally makes up about 60 to 70 percent of a normal adult. So if it was 60 percent in a 70 kilogram person that means approximately 42 liters of water are present. In the graphic on the top right you can see that fetus and neonates uh, have a lot of water. In fact, a baby at birth about 80% water, the normal adult in the middle at 70% water, and as we age we lose water and become 50-60% water. So decreases in percent body water, not only aging but obesity and female gender are associated with less of our body being water. Osmolality in the body normally is about 285 to 295 milliosmoles per kilogram. Most of that osmolarity is made up of sodium. In fact, we use two times the sodium plus glucose over 18 plus BUN over 2.8 as a way to estimate what the uh, osmolality is in a patient. So you can see that sodium is, has the largest factor in uh, osmolality. Your glucose would be, have to be very high to have a great effect, and your BUN quite high to also have an effect on osmolality. IV fluids, D5, is considered hypoosmolar, while hypertonic saline, 3% saline, is considered very hyperosmolar and has about 900 milliosmoles per liter. And usually we think of normal saline in lactated ringers as being essentially isoosmolar. In the body, the body water is distributed between the extracellular space, which is about a third of it, and the intracellular space, which is about two-thirds of it. The extracellular space can be divided into interstitial, about 25%, and plasma, 8% of the total space of the body. It helps us determine where a fluid is going to go when it's administered to a patient, these body compartments. Fluid types and components are next. And we'll look at normal saline first. Normal saline has 154 milliequivalents per liter of sodium in it and 154 milliequivalents per liter of chloride. That's a lot of chloride compared to what it normally is in our body. So we think of normal saline as being on the high end of sodium and very hyperchloremic. Ringer's lactate has lactate in it as an anion and chloride is only 109. Lactate is actually metabolized to bicarbonate and large volume Ringer's lactate can result in uh, a metabolic alkalosis. D5 is a lot of sugar and when it's metabolized it basically becomes water and distributes to the water space of the body but as it's supplied its osmolarity is only about 252. Albumin has a varying amount of sodium in it somewhere between 145 plus or minus 15 milliequivalents per liter and it is uh, hyperosmolar at about 330. starch is a starch containing colloid which uh, has an osmolarity of about 310 and has sodium and chloride in it at 154 sodium and 154 uh, of chloride milliequivalents per liter. 
comparing crystalloids to colloids. If you have a healthy glycocalyx, as previously mentioned, it will limit colloids to staying inside the blood vessel. If the glycocalyx is damaged, colloids can leak out into the interstitium. Um, and when we talk about intervascular expansion, or how much stays in the uh, blood vessels inside and hemodilute, the red blood cells that are there, colloids are much more effective at expanding the intervascular space. 5% albumin or HESPAN, if you give 100 milliliters of 5% albumin, approximately 100 mil intervascular volume expansion occurs. As opposed to crystalloids like lactated ringers and saline, if you give 100 mils of lactated ringers, approximately, although this has been debated recently, about a third of it stays intervascularly and results in volume expansion. So 100 mils of 5% albumin will expand the intervascular space more, dilute the red blood cells more, and cause more of a hemodilution. Albumin is very important for maintaining oncotic pressure, while sodium is very important for maintaining osmotic pressure. Both crystalloids and colloids can dilute the coagulation factors that are in the blood and cause a dilutional coagulopathy with ongoing large volume resuscitation. There is little difference in the efficacy between crystalloids and colloids. However, if you give a ton of crystalloids, you have a higher chance of getting peripheral edema uh, versus an equal volume, intervascular volume resuscitation uh, with a colloid. Head of starch not used so much anymore uh, and has been associated with a dilutional coagulopathy and uh, kidney issues. It reduces factor 8C and von Willebrand factor. It causes dilutional coagulopathy when given in large volume. It's recommended that you not exceed 20 mils per kilogram per day. That would be 20 mils times 70 kilos or approximately 1,500 mils in a 24-hour period. There has been associated uh, in the past, in association with renal injury and critically ill patients administered head of starch, and it tends not to be used much anymore as it was in the past in cardiopulmonary bypass primes. Some complications of crystalloids, 0.9 normal saline, chloride is 154 milliequivalents per liter in normal saline. That's hypochloremic. The strong ion difference has been defined as the cations, positively charged, minus the anions in your body. So if you give a large amount of an anion, chloride, it decreases the strong ion difference, more anions. And water dissociates to hydrogen ion to maintain electrical neutrality. You've given lots of chloride, negatively charged, water dissociates to a positively charged hydrogen ion, and so what are you gonna get if you have all that chloride? Hyperchloremic. What are you gonna get if you have a lot of hydrogen ion? dissociated to maintain electrical neutrality, you get acidosis. So large volume resuscitation with saline, let's say 10 liters of saline to a patient, can result in hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Lactated ringers, the lactate in it, the anion, is actually metabolized to bicarbonate, assuming that you have a functioning liver. Remember that citrate also is metabolized to bicarbonate in a functioning liver and can cause metabolic alkalosis if you've given a large amount of lactated ringers. There's some calcium in lactated ringers, and therefore we often will avoid giving blood through a line with lactated ringers in it. Um, the calcium may uh, precipitate the citrated blood that's being infused through the same line. The sodium in lactated ringers is only about 130 and can result in hyponatremia, and there is potassium in lactated ringers, and therefore if a patient is in complete renal failure, uh, we may avoid lactated ringers because that little bit of potassium in it could potentially build up in a patient with totally shut down uh, kidneys. D5W is hypoosmolar and it can actually increase brain water in someone with a traumatic brain injury. We don't want hypoosmolar solutions given to someone uh, with cerebral edema. The glucose present in it, if you administer uh, it to a patient who has a traumatic brain injury or stroke can worsen ischemic brain injury. Hyperglycemia at the time of ischemic brain injury can worsen that lesion. Glucose, if given to a patient with a rare disease hypokalemic periodic paralysis, can precipitate skeletal muscle paralysis. Why? If it's the hypokalemic variant, when you give glucose, the body uh, increases its output of insulin and insulin drives potassium into the cell, which drops the potassium level, and you get hypokalemic, which is a stimulus 
for paralysis of skeletal muscle in these patients with hypokalemic periodic paralysis. Clinical applications, uh, some miscellaneous topics. First of all, assessing volume status. We look at urine output and blood pressure and cardiac output, left ventricular and diastolic volume, wedge pressure, CVP and heart rate, all in an attempt to decide have we given enough volume or not. Fluid responsiveness is another thing that we can use to evaluate um, the uh, volume status of a patient. We use dynamic parameters, which are considered superior in predicting response to fluid loading than our static parameters like CVP. One thing you can do is passive leg lift and look at blood pressure changes and stroke volume if you're measuring it. There are heart-lung interactions that we use during mechanical ventilation to decide if there's pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation present um, and the more variation in stroke volume and the more variation in pulse pressure when you're mechanically ventilating someone, we say, aha, that's suggestive of a need for more fluids. And the picture at the top right shows stroke volume max uh, and then stroke volume minimum and a difference between those two. And the greater the difference between those two uh, during inspiration and expiration, we say uh, that's higher percent stroke volume variation or if we're measuring pulse pressure, higher pulse pressure variation, indicative of likely fluid responsiveness. If we give fluid to them, their cardiac output and stroke volume will increase. Bainbridge reflex refers to an atrial reflex where if you pour in a bunch of fluids and stretch the atrium, the body increases the heart rate in an attempt to get that atria back down to a more normal size. Bainbridge reflex. Some other clinical applications, burns during uh, crystalloid resuscitation of a burn patient, and crystalloids are what are used during the first day uh, rather than colloids usually. Colloids can increase edema. The Parkland formula is used to calculate how much fluids to give. Four mils of crystalloid per kilogram body weight for times it by the percent burn that is estimated in that patient and administer that during the first 24 hours after the burn and half of it given in that first eight hours after the burn and the other half given over the next 16 hours. So let's do a calculation. Let's assume we have a 100 kilogram person that had a 50% burn. Four mils times 100 would be 400 times the 50% burn would be about 20 liters. And so in the next 24 hours, you're going to give 20 liters of crystalloid, and you're going to give 10 liters in the first eight hours and another 10 liters in the next 16 hours. That's a lot of fluid, and people often will have a lot of peripheral edema after resuscitation with high volume crystalloid after burns. Traumatic, traumatic brain injury, or TBI, is another clinical application that we'll talk about. And the goal in someone with a TBI is to keep their intravascular volume up enough to maintain their blood pressure and cardiac output, good perfusion of their brain, while avoiding brain edema and increasing intracranial pressure. One of the important things is to maintain the osmolality, which sodium makes up the largest part of that, so isotonic crystalloids are widely used as opposed to hypotonic uh, fluids. We want to avoid hyperglycemia because we know High sugar in the presence of an injured brain, ischemic brain, can worsen it. Uh, and D5W would increase glucose and potentially decrease serum osmolality, which would be a bad thing. So D5W would be avoided in a patient with TBI. Hypertonic saline may be used to uh, attempt to raise osmolality and decrease intracranial pressure. Hypertonic saline is 3% saline with an osmolality of about 900 milliosmoles per liter, about three times or more that of our normal body. And by raising osmolality, we attempt to uh, keep the cerebral edema down and decrease intracranial pressure. This ends the short presentation on keywords related to fluids from the American Board of Anesthesia. These were the keywords that we covered, including glycocalyx, osmolality, metabolism of lactated ringers to bicarbonate, where fluids go and how much water is in the body, um, side effects of crystalloids versus colloids. We talked about strong ion difference and how it is decreased with 
high volume saline resuscitation and how high volume saline resuscitation can result in hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. We talked about hypokalemic periodic paralysis and the trigger being glucose containing fluids. And we talked about how we monitor volume status with things like uh, pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation to predict fluid responsiveness and uh, talked a bit about burns and the Parkland formula, four milliliters times kilograms times percent uh, burn administered over a 24 hour period with half of that given in the first eight hours, the next half given in the uh, uh, next 16 hours. And then lastly, uh, indications for hypertonic saline like traumatic brain injury and, and attempts to reduce uh, cerebral edema and avoiding sugar uh, like D5W in patients with traumatic brain injury. This ends the keyword presentation on fluids and anesthesia, and I hope you have a great day.